going to pick up where we left off in our sermon series, Address the Mess, A Guide to Healthy Relationships. And just by way of a very quick review, we are in Romans chapter 12. And Paul began Romans chapter 12 with an authoritative plea. He's talking to the Christians at Rome and he's commanding them and he's pleading with them by the mercies of God, because of the mercies of God, live a life of reasonable service. Well, as we've been very slowly working our way through Romans chapter 12, because it's filled with all kinds of great practical application, we have discovered that reasonable service is all about loving others. Reasonable service is all about having healthy relationships. Now, how many of you would agree when it comes to unpacking healthy relationships. How many of you would agree that there is a whole lot to unpack there? (laughs) Healthy relationships are a whole lot easier said than done. And I'm not going to go back and rehash everything that we've already covered in four weeks. If you want to get caught up on that, if you want to get caught up on the series, you can go to YouTube. All of it is there. All I want to say is this. We've been talking about our relationships with each other, but this morning we are going to go to a whole new level, the next level. Paul is going to be introducing something that we all know and we definitely don't love, and that something is conflict. The title of the message this morning is Fight Right. Go ahead and cue the sound bite. Go ahead and cue the sound bite. (laughs) This is the moment we've all been waiting for, for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble! All right, who's ready for a fight this morning? (laughs) All right, listen. We are going to learn how to fight right because here's the reality where there are people... There is conflict, right? There's conflict in our homes. There's conflict in our families. There's conflict at work. There's conflict in the church. There's conflict on the roads. I have a confession I have to make this morning. Can't talk about the roads, but we were, the other day, we were, I may or may not have mentioned to a van full of seniors that when it comes to the road, you don't have to be nice. We were in the middle of one of the craziest intersections of traffic I've ever seen in my entire life. It was every man for himself. And I was there for it, man. I was like, I was born for this moment right here. And the kids are all like, yeah. Because I said, you know, they they can't see the light of Jesus inside of here. And they said they can see the trailer with West Florida Baptist Church's name on it. I was like, good point. Okay. Anyway, (laughs) the point is this. When it comes to... Um, when it comes to conflict, where there are people, you can't make it through life without a fight. It's everywhere you look and it's everywhere you go. Before I jump into the heart of the message, and I'm just going to leave these out so we can get the idea and we can remember what we're talking about here today, I want us to understand something. You aren't my enemy. Okay. So I know we've been, as we've been going through this series, we've been talking a lot to each other as we've been going through this. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at your husband or your wife right now, or your spouse, or maybe your children, whoever you're sitting next to. And I want you to look right at them. And I want you to say, you aren't my enemy. Okay. Everybody go ahead and take a minute to do that. Man, I saw some of these people aren't even talking to each other. They look at each other and like, I'm not so sure about this. All right. Now turn to somebody that that's not a family member, just turn to somebody that's a church member and tell them the same thing. You aren't my enemy. Okay, that's excellent. I, I love what I'm seeing here. Go ahead and put Ephesians chapter 6, verse um, 10 up on the screen. Go ahead, Ephesians chapter 6. Here's a principle that I want us all to understand. This is the big picture before we even jump into the message this morning that I want us to see. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible says this. For we wrestle not against what? Everybody out loud with me. Flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. When it comes to conflict... People are not the enemy. 
People might be what we see right in front of us, but what we have to understand is there's a big picture. There's a greater opposition. There is Satan, and there is the world system that has been created and stacked against us, and he knows exactly how to push our buttons. But when it comes to conflict, ultimately, we're not fighting against each other. We're fighting a greater enemy. We're fighting a bigger battle. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. And if we're going to be successful in the fight, we've got to learn how to fight right. One of the things I've learned while I was studying for this message this week is that a fight, it doesn't matter if it's a military fight, if it's a boxing match, if it's UFC, fights are not necessarily run by, uh, not won by tactics, they're more won by following basic principles. The principles that we live by will determine whether we survive and whether we thrive in this life. And so this morning, we're going to use some of the golden rules of boxing to stick with our theme. And by the way, this is not a boxing ring up here. I know that you know that. We have the school play this week, so that's why that's up. It has nothing to do with what's happening here this morning. We have the school play here later this week. But this morning, we're going to use some of the golden rules of boxing to apply timeless principles that God gives us here in Romans chapter 12. That will help us, that will guide us to be able to survive and thrive in the midst of all the conflict of life. So let's just jump right in. We got four things that we're going to look at today. Here is principle number one. Principle number one is step with purpose. Step with purpose. Um, When it comes to fighting and particularly boxing, too many fighters waste energy and miss opportunities to land a meaningful punch. The reason why is they're moving, they're dancing, they're hopping, they're bouncing, they're jumping all around, but they're never really taking a meaningful step. Now, I'm not going to try to demonstrate that for you. I did a workout one day that was kind of like a boxing workout. I am not coordinated at all. All right. And so I know I would be wasting a lot of energy. I would not be moving with purpose at all. But the idea is this. Move when it's meant to accomplish something. Move when it's meant to accomplish something. When it gets you out of danger, when it puts you in a position to go on the, uh, the offensive, to be able to land a meaningful punch, step with authority, step with purpose, step with a clear intention to gain an advantage. Now look at how this applies here in Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 14 with me. It says this, bless them which, what's the next word there? persecute you. Bless and curse not. Bless them which persecute you. To bless means to speak well of. It goes even further. It means to call down a blessing on someone by prayer. So what is God commanding us? He's commanding us to speak well of, to pray for blessings on our persecutors, the people who cause us to suffer emotionally and physically. And then he says at the end of that verse, he says, bless and Curse not. I'm glad he adds that in there. Bless and curse not. To curse, that's exactly what we want to do, right? When it comes to our enemies, we we want everybody to know the pain that they're causing us. We want everybody to know how wrong they are. We want everybody to know how vile they are. We want to get revenge. We want to plot ways to get back at those who bring suffering into our lives. But the practical application here, when it talks about stepping with purpose, We're going to learn how to fight, right? You know what we need to do? Bless your persecutors. Bless your persecutors. Your persecutors. The people who have done you harm, whether it was accidentally, whether it was intentionally. I think about different types of persecution. Have any of you ever had to deal with somebody jealous in your life? Any ever had a jealous person that just has created a whole lot of havoc in your life? How about a jaded spouse? Or maybe a jaded friend or a jaded family member. Maybe they're jaded for good reason because of some of the things that you've done along the way or acted. But that can create a lot of suffering. That can create a lot of emotional pain in your life. What about a mean neighbor? Anybody got any mean neighbors? Okay, sometimes you have to deal with situations like that. Or how about um, just a coworker that is just difficult to deal with every day? Or maybe you have a petty boss or a manager and they're there in your life every single day. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? There's persecution in life. There's, con- there's conflict that comes in life. But what Paul's talking about here makes all of that pale in comparison 
He's talking to the Roman Christians. And you know what the Roman Christians were experiencing? Very real persecution. It could have been around this very time that Nero started persecuting Christians. He blamed the fire that spread through Rome on Christians. And he was literally burning them at the stake just because of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. All right, so persecution has all different kinds of forms and all different kinds of levels. And you know what the Bible is saying here? Bless your persecutors. By the mercies of God, bless. You know what God wants us to long for? Here, here's where we can just put this down to the root and just get down to the point of what he's talking about. God wants us to long for the good of others. God wants us to long for the good of others. Look what he says in Luke 6, 28. Go ahead and put Luke 6, 28 up on the screen. He says this, bless them that curse you, something very similar to what we're talking about here. This is Jesus himself speaking. And then he says, and pray for them which despitefully use you. You know, when we go before God and we start praying for things, you know what we're praying for? We're praying for the things that are closest to our heart. We're praying for the things that we long for. And there's no doubt if you're experiencing persecution, if you're experiencing conflict in your life at the hands of other people, it's going to be close to your heart. It's going to be something that's on your mind. But you know what God wants us to long for? You know how you can step with purpose, how you can gain a clear advantage over the enemy? Don't long for their harm. Don't long for them to come to destruction, but long for them to experience the goodness of God the same way that you and I have experienced the goodness of God. That's how we step with purpose. We go before God and we ask God to open up their eyes, to change their heart, to bring them to repentance, to help them to see that the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross is powerful enough to change everything. Step with purpose. How many of you agree? That, that's not an easy thing to do right there. Again, we, we want to curse. We want revenge. But God says, bless your persecutors. Secondly, this morning, not only do we need to step with purpose, but secondly, we need to commit to constant movement. Commit to constant movement. When you commit to constant movement, man, when you are in good shape and you have trained and you are conditioned, one of the things that constant movement is going to do, it's going to wear your opponent down. Keeping up with somebody that's just moving around like that, it's going to wear them down, but it's going to do something even more than that. Perpetual movement is hard to deal with, and it adds an unknown that makes your opponent uncomfortable and hesitant, okay? So the more you're moving around, they don't know what you're going to do next. He doesn't know what's coming his way, and so he becomes uncomfortable. He becomes hesitant, and while he's hesitant, that gives you an opportunity to go on the offensive and to land some punches back. And so I love how this transitions. I mean, he starts off Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. And then it seems almost as if he's going to go away from conflict. But all I'm saying is this is the best way to strike back against Satan and his enemies. Look what he says in verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. This is what loving others looks like. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. How many of you would agree this morning life is hard? Life's hard. It's difficult. And then you add conflict and you add persecution and you got enemies and all of that just makes life even more complicated and more difficult. And here we are commanded to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. That's what God's saying to do. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Here's the practical application. Constant movement. Be empathetic. Be empathetic. Not just sympathetic. Sympathy is not a bad thing, but you know what sympathy is? Sympathy is when you feel for another person. I mean, you feel sorry that they're going through that, but, but you don't necessarily understand them or what they're going through. And you don't even necessarily have to try. You can just say, oh, man, that situation sounds like a terrible situation. And you feel that sympathy, but you kind of walk away from it and go back to living your own life. And you don't necessarily put yourself in someone else's shoes. Empathy takes it a step further. Empathy is the person's ability to recognize and share the emotions of another person, okay? We have a stage that is set behind us. You know who does this really, really well? You know who, who shows and expresses empathy? Actors. Now, is there anybody in here this morning that's in our school play coming up Thursday and Friday? Anybody in it? Where are you at? Okay, I see some hands going up in the back right there. I know that Ms. Valdez, um, your your director, I know one of the things that she's going to tell you is that when you step out on stage, you are no longer you. 
You are now your character. And the best actors, they put themselves completely in their character. They try to know everything about their character. They try to become that character. I'm married to an actor. I've seen her perform before. And man, she gets in a zone and she tunes everything else out. And you go and you become who you're going to portray. Do you understand that this is exactly, in a sense, what God's telling us to do? Not to act but to literally put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Desire to understand. Man, when it comes to, re- you know the best way we can, we can fight back and keep ourselves from going into conflicting situations? Desire to understand other people. Desire to understand what they're going through, why they're acting that way. You know, sometimes uh, kids at school, for instance, that act out a lot, a lot of times there's reasons behind it. A lot of times the anger and the bitterness and the reason why people are lashing out is because there is something there that you don't understand that maybe if you did, you would have some empathy and you would feel sorry uh, for the things that they've experienced and the things that they're going through. Hey, desire to feel. Feel what other people are going through. Don't just have sympathy, but actually imagine if it was you that was in that situation. Imagine if it was your family. Imagine if it was the other way around. Desire to feel. Have genuine compassion. Man alive, what would our relationships look like if we were empathetic and if we were attacking back at Satan that way? We weren't just dodging the bullets, but we were going on the offensive and we were literally putting ourselves out there and having the kind of relationships that God wants us to have. Be empathetic. But not only that, be yielding. Be yielding. Look at verse 16. I'm just going to go slowly through this verse. I want to break it down. There's so much good stuff here. He says, be of the same mind one toward another. What do you think that means? To be of the same mind towards one another, that means that what you seek for yourself, seek for others. So the things that you desire for you, desire that for other people too. All right, and then he says from there, mind not high things. Don't seek after an elevated rank in life. Don't look to separate yourself from other people in wealth, power, or position. Now, this is... (laughs) This is a lesson that the world tells you the complete opposite of. I've told you before that one of my favorite shows that I used to like to watch was called The Apprentice. And uh, I just, I enjoyed that show. That was back before uh, Donald Trump was the president of the United States. And it was a lot of fun to watch that show. But you know what that show? That show's not teaching biblical principles. That show, it's like, it's a dog eat dog world. And whatever you got, you got to stab somebody in the back to get to the top. Then that's what you need to do. And God's telling us, no. That's not at all how I want you to live. Don't position yourself. Don't put yourself against other people to position yourself to get ahead of them in life. Mind not high things. And then he says something huge. Condescend to men of low estate. This is where we get that, the idea of be yielding. This is where it comes from. That word condescend, it means yield to the thoughts, the feelings, the plans of the lowly or the vulnerable or those who are hurting and going through something, those who have need, literally, be carried away with the lowly. As Christians, as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world, God doesn't want us just to associate with the lowly. He wants us to be drawn to the lowly. He wants us to be affected. He wants us to be moved. He wants us to be changed by the lowly. And by the way, if we're going to commit to constant movement, it's going to require focus. It's going to require energy. And the best way to stay focused and the best way to stay energized is to look to Jesus. Hey, do you know where we were? We were lost. We were lowly. We were in need. We were sinners. There's nothing that we could do to pay for our sin. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ and because of the sacrifice of his son, we have been forever changed. Are you thankful that God was drawn to you and your needs, that he was affected by you and your needs, that he was changed by you and your needs to the point that he was willing to do something about it? Hey, commit to constant movement. Be empathetic. Yield. It's not about me. It's not about what I can gain from life. And you want to live at a higher level. Live for others. Selflessly, sacrificially serve. You will be blessed. The next point is this. Accept responsibility. Accept responsibility. Step with purpose. Commit to constant movement. 
accept responsibility. This is another key principle when it comes to boxing, when it comes to fighting. Win, lose, or draw, guess what? Especially in a sport like boxing, you only have yourself to blame. It's not about who or who wasn't in your corner, okay? You can't blame that cheerleader in the corner. You can't blame them if they're not there. At the end of the day, it's you in the ring, and it's up to you. Hey, it's not about the coaching that you had in life. It's not even about your injuries, It really doesn't matter how you've been injured along the way. It's not about your opponent and how much bigger and stronger and faster he is than you. Do you understand this morning that if you are a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. He is a miracle working God. He can make a way when there is no way. And there is no reason at all that we cannot survive and thrive in the conflicts of life. So we got to accept responsibility. Look at verse 17. Look how this plays out. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Okay, so now we're back into conflict. This is the second time he's commanding us. He already said, bless and curse not. Now he's saying, recompense to no man evil for evil. Don't repay evil with evil. Don't look for revenge. Don't look to get back at your enemy. And then at the end, he's going to say, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Three different times in this passage, we are commanded by God not to respond. Not to respond. How many of you agree that is probably the hardest thing in the world to do? (laughs) So he says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Don't plot your revenge. Instead, do this. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. You know what that word honest means? It means beautiful to look at praiseworthy. You know the practical application here. If you're going to accept responsibility, you know what our goal should be? Fight beautifully. Fight beautifully. You remember Muhammad Ali? Anybody remember him? Remember he floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee? I mean, all of the phrases that he came up with, but man, there was something beautiful about the way that he fought. When you are a skilled fighter, there is something to marvel at. There is a beauty inside of it. And as the children of God, he wants us to be beautiful in the way that we respond to conflict. He wants it to be such that it is praiseworthy in the sight of man and in the sight of God. So provide things honest. If we're going to do that, you know what that word provide means? That word provide means to take measures in preparation for. So if we're going to fight beautifully, we've got to prepare to fight beautifully. You've got to prepare to live in a way that is beautiful and praiseworthy. You've got to prepare how to win over your enemy instead of destroying them. And that might start on a Sunday morning like this. Here we are at church. How many of you got conflict in your life? Anybody got a situation that you can think of? I know it's, it's everybody. Maybe it's big right now, maybe it's small, I don't know, but it's always there, right? Well, if we're going to be successful and if we're going to fight beautifully, we got to prepare our mindset. It's not about destroying and putting our enemies down. It's about winning them over and pointing them to Christ. And mentally, we've got to think and we've got to prepare, be prepared for that. Verse 18 builds on this idea. All right, everybody read verse 18 out loud with me. Help me out on this one. This is a tough one, okay? Here we go. Verse 18, it says... If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I love how the practical the Bible is. God is saying here, if it be possible. He knows that it's, it's not always going to work out. You're not always going to win your enemy. doesn't matter what you do. They might not change. They might continue to persecute you. But if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, with everything that you got, as much as you're capable of. And God knows our frame. He knows that we're, we're but dust. He knows that we're sinners. But by the mercies of God, because of what he did for you on the cross, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. What if we actually followed that rule? What if in our conflict, instead of responding to people with bitterness and slander and anger, what if... We respond it with a soft answer and kindness. Man, the Bible tells us that a soft answer turns away wrath. I have found that to be true in my life over and over again. When you humble yourself, when you accept responsibility, when you try to find a way to make things right. Wow, God can really bless that. Hey, what if we didn't pour fuel on the fire, but we were quick to make things right? You know, we're good at that. The second somebody 
The second somebody initiates, oh, we retaliate, man. We're ready to go. It's like what I said earlier when I was in that traffic. I, it was crazy that day. Everybody was coming from different directions, and you're vying for position. You got to go. And I was there for it. Sometimes we're just there for the fight, right? We get engaged. We're ready for it. We're ready to go to war. That's not how we're supposed to be as Christians. What if instead of pouring fuel on the fire... We instantly went to that person before it escalated and blew up, and we said, hey, man, I don't want to fight with you. I want to figure out how to make things right. What, what can we do to fix this situation? It might work. It might not. But what, what would happen if that's how we were? Hey, how many problems could be eliminated if we, were, if we ourselves were honest in all of our business dealings? Have you ever stretched the truth a little bit? I'm not going to accuse you of lying this morning, but have you ever just kind of skewed the truth just a hair so that you come out looking a little bit better on one side or you angle your things a certain way so that the people that you're talking to will, but all along you have a motive and you have a reason for why we're doing things. I've been there before in my life. I, I, we're human beings. We do that. But what if we were just honest? What if we were straightforward? What if we were kind? What if, what if we weren't the ones that were the problem? What if we lived right in the sight of God before all men? How many things? What if we had the best interest of others in mind? How many situations could we get out of and how many situations could we save ourselves from going through? By the way, imagine how beautiful this would be too. To remind Satan that we're not pawns that are going to fall for his little schemes and tricks. Because the second we dive into that conflict and the second that bitterness starts sinking in and the second that anger starts welling up, he's winning. And we're losing. And how beautiful would it be when Satan's best attempts at bringing us down and marring the light of Jesus Christ in our lives were put back against him. And he was reminded once again that he is powerless against what Jesus Christ has done in us and through us and the Holy Spirit that enables us to do exceeding abundantly above anything we could ask or think. And here's the last point. And this is my favorite one. And by the way, I know there's... Romans 12 has been tough because there are so many one-liners. I could Honestly, I could probably spend a year, and you could unpack every single one of these. As we go through this, my, my goal even this morning is just that the Bible speaks for itself, honestly. And this is a good primer. When you find yourself in conflict, just go back to this and saturate your mind with it. Meditate on it over and over again, and you're going to find the principles that you need to thrive in the middle of all of that. But this last one, man, I have used... These last few verses with so many different people, especially when they have been hurt and they have been severely wronged in their life. And here's the last point. Make your opponent miss and pay. I like this point. Make your opponent miss and pay. A good defense is only as valuable as the openings it creates. So if you're really good at, at dodging the bullet and you're staying out of the conflict, that's awesome. But if you're just sitting back admiring how good and skilled you are at staying out of fights, but you're not doing anything to strike back, you're not doing anything to, to land a punch, to get some points to score, what good? How valuable is that defense if you have no offense? So we've got to make our opponent miss, but at the same time, we've got to make them pay. We've got to be elusive, but we've got to be aggressive in return. Make your opponent miss. Look what it says in verse 19. Everybody... I'm going to have you help me out here, okay? It says, dearly beloved, and then what are the next three words, everybody out loud together? Avenge not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves. Make your opponent miss. Avenge not yourself. Here we are one more time told, do not respond to the things that are coming at you. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. When we don't return evil for evil, when we don't try to take revenge into our own hands, we make Satan miss. He's already been defeated in that. He threw a punch and we dodged the bullet and it's wonderful. But you know what I really, really, really love about this point? You know what? Did you catch what that verse said? Don't just get caught up on the avenge not yourself and vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But what does he say? Go back to verse 19. I want everyone to look at it again. I'm going to have you read a different line with me this time. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Everybody read that next phrase with me. Ready? Out loud. But rather give place unto wrath. You know what God's telling us to do? Don't take matters into your own hands. Let go. But let me take care of it. Let God handle it. Let go and let God. That's essentially what he's saying here. Avenge not yourself, 
but rather give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Who can handle your problems, you or God? Who can handle them better? God can, a whole lot more thoroughly. And that verse says, rather give place to wrath. There are two ways we clearly see the wrath of God poured out. One of the ways is on the cross of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that God takes sin seriously? Serious enough that the only way that his wrath would be satisfied was in the death of his innocent, spotless son who became sin for us. And we talked about that. We just celebrated Easter and we had a good Friday service and we went through all that Jesus suffered and how he bled and how he died and the things that he went through, how he was tormented and he died on that cross so that we could be saved. If God's death on the cross, if his son Jesus was good enough to save you and to save me, then is his wrath that was poured out on his son Jesus and the forgiveness that is available as well, is it good enough for the people who are causing harm in your life? And the answer to that question is yes. And the blessing that we're praying is that they would come to know and to see Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that God would change them in every way possible. But guess what? If they don't come to repentance, and if they don't come to faith in Jesus Christ, the other way that we see God's wrath is in a place called hell. How many of you would agree that eternity in hell is sufficient enough for any wrong and any crimes that have been done to you or against you or against anyone in this life? I promise you, the severity of God's wrath and how he will fully pay, man, you might think that if you let go, that you're not going to get the justice that you're seeking. You are wrong. When you place it in God's hands, you will get every single ounce of justice that there is to get out of that situation. So avenge not yourselves. Let go of it. Put it in God's hands. Make your opponent miss. But are you ready for the good part? You ready for something that's really hard? Make them pay. Look at verse 20. It says this, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, everybody help me out loud together. Thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Some of you are finally thinking, finally. <laughs> heap coals of fire on their head. Make them burn. Make them feel some pain, right? I mean, this is finally something that speaks to our sinful human nature. And there's no doubt about it. When we're talking about heaping coals of fire on our enemies or on our persecutors' heads, there's no doubt that he's talking about intense pain and agony. But it's not the kind that you're thinking of. Let's go back and look at that, that verse again. Look at the beginning of it. You guys help me out, okay? It says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, what's it say to do? If he thirst." You understand what he's telling us? The way that we fight back again is not by revenge and vengeance. We fight back with good works. We fight back by doing good things. If our enemy is hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And in so doing, you're going to heap coals of fire upon their head. The kind of intense pain that it's going to cause in our, in our uh, persecutors' lives, in our enemies' lives. It's the kind of intense pain that comes from shame, that comes from remorse, that comes from conviction, that comes from the fear of standing before an almighty God in their sin and in their wrongdoing. When you start doing good, you know, what's the Bible tell us? The Bible says that the goodness of God brings man to repentance, right? How many times has somebody... Man, how many times have you treated, maybe let's put it inside of marriage. Have you ever treated your spouse wrong and did something really ridiculous and they didn't respond to you in kind, but they responded to you in kindness? And then all of a sudden you instantly feel small and you feel, oh, man, I'm just like the worst human being that's ever been alive. How many times have you done that with God? How many times have you gone to God in prayer and you know that you got nothing to say, but I am guilty. I got issues. I got problems. I am messed up. And how did God meet you there? with forgiveness and mercy and that goodness of God wells up inside of you? 
Human nature is flawed. It's broken. People got deep-seated problems. But guess what? When, when you are being dealt with kindness, whether or not that person sees it or not, you know other people will see it. Your children will see it. Your friends will see it. Your neighbors will see it. Your coworkers will see it. Live in a way that is praiseworthy before God. Live in a way that causes people to respond in awe, not at your strength, not in your power, but in who God is and the work that Jesus Christ is doing inside of our hearts and in our lives. And by the way, whether or not that person changes doesn't matter because you know who is changed? You. And when you're able to respond, not in bitterness, when you're able to let it go and you're able to do good works and to love anyway, you're set free. You're not living under the bondage and the power of that anymore. You're able to live in a way that is new and invigorating where the Holy Spirit of God is empowering you and enabling you. Man, if we're going to fight, we got to fight right. And the way that the Bible tells us to live is completely different than the way that this world tells you to live. Man, I read some things this week that are just completely contrary to everything we talked about today. Man, I, I read one that was just talking about forgetting uh, the people that are persecuting in your life. They were saying, don't give them any space in your mind. The more space that you give them in your mind, the more that the ratings go up on there. They were comparing it to a TV show. The more that the ratings go up, just ignore it and forget about it. That's a pretty good first step, but the Bible tells us to do more than that. Don't just ignore it and forget about it. Do something about it. Respond to them the same way that Jesus would respond to them. Respond the way that Jesus responded to us. Make your opponent miss, but make them pay by living and loving the way that Jesus lived and loved us.